happen. Now let's go to Australia. Colin Reardon is standing by. Colin, good morning to you. Good evening where you are. How's it going? Not too bad, lads. How are things? Yeah, listen, congratulations. Uh, your debut at the weekend, it couldn't really have gone any better for you, could it? Yeah, no, not really, I suppose. It was, it was very special. Um, obviously, with the match, the match, the way it went, and especially the result, um, yeah, it was, it was one of those days that you dream of, probably not as a kid, but um, certainly since I've came here, and um, yeah, it was just very special, especially to get the win, and everyone was on a bit of a high after, which made it even better. Tell us a little bit about your journey to get there, because um, you've had injuries, you've had setbacks, you broke a bone in your back, you had a punctured lung. Did you feel like you were going to make it the whole way through? Did you always have that confidence that you would end up making your debut at some point? I think you have to, you have to have kind of, you have to have self belief, and um, I guess I never really, I never really stopped believing in myself or, or believing that I could make it at the highest level. Um, obviously, you get setbacks, but when you get a setback or you get an injury like that, it gives you the opportunity to do something else. Like, and it, and it sounds like a cliche, but at the end of the day, if you get the opportunity to do this, you may as well give it, give it your all, and that's what I tried to do. Um, injury is part and parcel of the game. You just, you can't suck over it. You can't, you can't go on about it because if if that's what you do, you'll never end up anywhere. Um, but yeah, if you get setbacks, you just have to get over them and treat them as another challenge and another opportunity that you're going to get stronger from, I guess. It's always easier uh, when you have a contract already in the bag when the injuries happen, because at least you know you're, you're there for the long haul. So when I think you were actually in the middle of the injury when you signed the, the two-year deal, if I'm not mistaken. So that was a real sign of confidence that the Sydney Swans want you, they believe in you, and that exactly is, is what you want to hear from an organisation. Yeah, exactly. They showed massive belief in me, massive faith in me, and then I, I just wanted to repay them ever ever since they they gave me the opportunity. And then I was lucky enough to get the chance last last Sunday. And then yeah, like I said, it was it was a special day. But I really just wanted to repay the faith they showed in me, and and uh, I tried to do that for as long as I can. Anyway. A couple of things struck me. Um, when we we're just doing a, a bit of reading around this uh, on your Twitter handle. You don't talk first about being. And as your rules player, you talk about being a business student. So you're making sure that you're actually doing stuff outside of being a professional athlete at the same time. Was that always your plan, or is that something that your folks kind of said when you were heading out? Do you have to do? Was it? How did that come about? Not really, to be honest. I guess the club probably we're lucky enough. We've we've won the best player player welfare managers, one of the best men I've ever met, to be honest. And he encourages you. He encourages you to do stuff outside of football. And and he always says to us, "You're more than athletes. You're more than." Your people first, and you're you're a player second. And at the end of the day, football could end tomorrow. Touch what it won't, but it could. And um, if that happens, you need something to fall back on. So I, I'm lucky enough. I'm, I'm studying a business degree here, and um, yeah, it gives you a bit of a bit of leeway and something to fall back on if things did if things did go wrong, which, which hopefully it doesn't. But um, at least you have that comfort behind you that you have something to fall back on. Yeah. Colin, I suppose sport uh, is Shane here. Sport is a sort of a fickle, a fickle career, really. Um, would you have seen an awful lot of players come and go, like maybe you know international sort of players like yourself come and go in the few years you're, you've been there and see how it, it doesn't always end up like it has for you, whereby you get that professional start? Yeah, no question about it. Um, since I since I've been here, I think I've only been here two and a half years, and I think probably twenty people have turned over on the list of a list of forty seven. Um, 20 have turned over, so I guess every year they probably clear about 25% of the list, and um, like you, you see them lads going, and it was a shock to me at the start, professional sport, that you know, it's, it's a ruthless industry, and um, you become close to these boys, and, and suddenly then you realise you come back from off-season, and you, some of them you might never see again, and that's, that's, that was hard for me in the first year, I didn't really understand that, I didn't, I didn't understand how you could just cut someone and, and they're gone then, um, probably never given another opportunity. So it is a ruthless industry and something that, you know, you just you just have to get used to. And um, I guess the only thing you really have to do is make sure you're not one of them at the end of the year. And like, what's the living situation when you move there first? Because, you know, you're taken away from your family, your, your friends, all that kind of thing. So do you start off in digs and then eventually go out, your, uh, out on your own? Yeah, I get, the Swans are a bit different. A lot of clubs, if an international player comes in, they, they live with the host family, but and um, the Swans are actually one of the only clubs that don't they don't really encourage that they encourage you to live with live with an older player so um when I came over first I lived with Alir Alir um and Tom Papley they're two lads obviously on the team um Alir was in his third year and me and Tom were in our in their first year obviously so what they what they do with the Swans they kind of encourage you to live in the housing program there's four or five houses in the housing program um and it's say a third year third year players kind of 
the leader of the house and um, they encourage all the young lads, show them their ropes, show them what happens and then they move on and it's kind of up to you to, to take over the mantle. So then last year, um, I, I was probably the leader of the house and then this year I moved out and someone else moved in and, and it's just it's that progression and continuous building of what they feel is the leadership and both on and off the field. I was just going to ask, yeah, go on, yeah. what, what's the, the shock in the, to the system in terms of the, the training you do over there? Daniel Flynn told me before about one time they flew to the Middle East and they did 100, 100 metre sprints as well. Can you tell me about anything that might have been a shock to the system for you? Yeah, we, we, never, we never flew to the Middle East now, but um, um, <laughs> we, do, we, do a fair, we do a fair bit of running all right. Um, I guess pre-season is a bit different than in-season and it's just a case, a lot of time of pre-season, you just have to kind of get through it. And it is a grind. And by the end of it, all you want to do is play games. And I think you have to remember that at the end of the day, you're going to be playing games. And, and when, you, when it comes into the in-season program, it's, it's a lot different. But for an example, like pre-season session will be probably a, a two and a half hour um, running session on the field. Um, there wouldn't be much football. You'd see a little bit of football, but you wouldn't see much. Um, you'd probably clock up maybe 13, 14 kilometers in two and a half hours and, High intensity running and, and competitive running against other lads, so it's it's fairly track and field stuff. Um, not much, probably three times a week you do that. Recover at the weekend, um, three or four gym sessions in between, and then um, yeah, like I say, recover at the weekend and do it all again for probably 16 weeks in pre-season, and then and you go out of hard for for 27 weeks in season. What was the homesickness like at the start? Because I mean. You know, you said you're there two and a half, three years at this point, which means that you were still a very young man when you went out, but quite old in, in Aussie rules terms. So you've got that culture shock of everybody knowing the language and, uh, I mean, the language of the game and the kind of just the normal arithmetic of where to take up positions and how the ball works. And then also that difference of living in a house with two grown men who you don't know. Yeah, you, it's funny, actually, because you don't have much of a choice when you, when you go in initially. Um, you're kind of given you're given this house and you're told you're going to be living with this lad and it just happens that Lear is a Sudanese a Sudanese fella he came from Sudan as a refugee when he was seven years of age so it was just it was kind of ironic that there was going to be an Irish lad a Sudanese lad and then an Australian living in the one house so it was, it was a fairly diverse house all right but um, it is a bit of a culture shock especially but I guess you could just embrace it like um, they didn't probably understand me for the first few for the first few weeks and a lot of them still don't understand me now but um, it's just, it's just, you just get used to it. Like it's, it's great crack over here, and you do everything with the lads. You, you sleep, you sleep in the same house together. You go and eat breakfast together. You go to the club together. So you're, you're with each other for probably ninety percent of the day, and um, it's just something you have to embrace and, and just absolutely love it, or else you won't succeed. It's simple as. Obviously, Ty Canelli's been back involved with the Sydney Swans uh, specifically this year. Uh, to what extent has he helped you out? Just seeing, I guess, another familiar Irish face uh, around the club, I presume that's been a bit of a help. Ah, for sure. Like, like obviously, his, his resume speaks for itself. Like, <clears throat> he's obviously done everything and won the highest level and won nearly all the accolades you can win over here and won the ultimate one, obviously, which is the flag. And his, his guidance throughout the, throughout the year, especially, especially in my first year, actually, <clears throat> probably more so than this year, um, was, was, was something else. He, he helped me throughout, throughout my first year a lot, got me over made sure I felt at home, was comfortable with everything, and um, I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll thank him forever for that. Um, he probably helped me when I was struggling a little bit with homesickness, and um, it's massive to have someone like that in the club. And, and this year then, he just he's encouraged me to go to the next level with my game, uh, take it on more, and, and just express myself. And I guess one thing he always says to me is don't ever forget um, why this one has drafted you. And that's probably something that stuck with me because you don't want to change the game, change my game in order to in order to facilitate them when, when they saw something in me that they drafted. So I was probably trying to change it a bit too much at the start. But um, yeah, he, he gave me that reassurance that just play your natural game and you'll get there. So there's been a few one-on-one -on -one <laughs> sessions going on. And like, would that be a usual thing or is it kind of like not, not special treatment, but for somebody who's so new to the game that there needs to be a few extra sessions done on more of the basic elements of the game? Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, for sure. Like obviously, I had to do I had to do a fair few extra sessions um, for the first two years, especially. And this year, like you don't ever stop doing them because you think you made your debut. Now you can stop. You can lag off. Like if you do it, actually, you'll be caught out fairly quickly. I've no doubt about that. So you can't stop. Or it's probably something else he told me. You can't just accept that you're you played one AFL game. Now it's the next next few weeks are going to be hard to, to keep that consistent run going and. 
it's just something you have to embrace, like I said. And um, yeah, the guidance, the guidance he's given me, and and the extra pitch sessions, the extra touch sessions, like you could. He says to me, you want to touch a ball about two and a half thousand times a day, which which sounds crazy, but um, <clears throat> so I could be at home and I'd just be handballing, handballing it to myself, and it, you just get your touch in. Like it's it's crazy thinking about that many times you touch a ball, but in order to get there, you kind of have to do it, and you don't have much of a choice. So, so you're just carrying the ball around with you all day, just to, and, and will you see the two and a half thousand as a target in your head? Yeah, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't probably count them exactly now, but you get a fair, <laughs> you get a fair indication. Like, there's no paper and pen, but um, now you, you just, whenever, whenever you get the chance to grab a ball, like you grab a lad and you just like have a handball game with them or a, or, or kicking a kicking game with them or something like it's just it's just a matter of holding the ball and getting used to it really. We've had um, some videos through. Uh, I think your brother had one from the the family house at home, which is uh, decked out in the Sydney Swans colours. Uh, that uh, I mean that must be amazing to kind of see the home house and uh, your jerseys hanging on the wall and just the level of excitement that there is back at home. Yeah, it's a bit special. Obviously, um, obviously Kevin couldn't make it out here, but. He's certainly done everything he could at home, and um, yeah, it's massive. Obviously, it makes me it makes me grow an extra an extra level as well. And you feel ten foot tall running out on the field, knowing that you have the support of your family and friends, and, and it's just yeah, like the only way you can describe it is it's something special, really. Yeah, because I mean we video footage as well of the the walkout and the christening as well, which we can roll here as well. Um, the debut when it comes, did you know in advance that you were going to be making it this weekend? How how soon before do you actually get the word that you're playing? Yeah, I was, I was lucky enough. Um, I think they understand when you're inter- when you're an international an international player that you need a bit of notice, and um, it's a, it's a bit it's probably a bit of a bigger deal for for everyone. And then um, they have to fly. They wanted to fly my dad over, so they they told me on Tuesday morning that I was going to be playing. And then um, obviously the news the news broke then on Thursday night. So I had that two days to myself where I could kind of think about the journey and, and think about where I've come from and stuff like that. And it's just. When you look back at it, like, and you think of where you came from and the journey that it took you to get where you are, it's kind of, it's kind of humbling to, to hear everyone, the well wishes from everyone, especially. Um, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah, and then uh, obviously your teammates understand it's a big deal as well because uh, you get christened afterwards. Yeah, you get christened obviously with the Gatorade shower. You end up being all a, a ball of stick for a while, but um, I know it's great. Like the lads, the lads, it, it's something special. I think they're doing that over here and. It probably doesn't happen at home in the ZEA where you get the, you sing the song at the end of the game, but I think it's very special and it just brings everyone together after a hard fought game and you get the win and you sing a song and it just makes that tight, tight knit group that everyone wants to be a part of and I think it actually brings another dimension to the game to be honest. Yeah, a couple of quick questions about Tipperary football, obviously, because um, the the underage team that you were a part of was fairly sensational. But um, you were a 15 year old winning a minor All Ireland as a <coughs> wing back, um, and then ultimately uh, you would have been a midfielder really for the senior team. Is that right? That was it. Yeah. So I I probably started off wing back and um, didn't know much about defending. Just said I'd run forward as much as I could and, and get a few loose balls, and then. Probably progressed. They finally realised that and pushed me up to midfield. And um, yeah, it was, it's obviously they had a, a, probably a, for their own standards had a bad enough year this year um, compared to what compared to getting to the semi final a couple of years ago. But um, look, I've no doubt it, you don't become a bad team overnight just because you you play one bad game. Um, I still think it's it's a it's a process, a building process. And um, a lot of them lads are very young. And obviously, we've lost a good few lads to, to the team that won the minor. But um, Look, if, if they stick with it, I've no doubt that they'll be a serious, serious, um, serious team in a few years. Thinking back, why did that team come together at the same time? Were you all part of a development squad that had a particularly good coach? Was it just that Tipperary was finally able to begin to find the young football talent and put it together? What happened? Oh, geez, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard one, and it, you don't really, you can't really put a word on it. It's, it was a special group, that's for sure. Um, it was probably there was probably I don't know twenty five probably thirty but there was thirty extremely gifted footballers on our panel especially in that minor one and um, it, it'd be interesting to see where everyone's at now and um, how much of that thirty is still actually playing but um, yeah I, I can't really I can't really put my finger on it it was just a special feeling the group probably committed to it listened to everything um, from obviously from when we won the minor listened to Dave Power took it all in and um, listened to Johnny Evans and the backroom team and. 
that was probably it. You just bought into it and you gave it a crack and you realised that you can actually mix it with the big boys. You can mix it with Dublin, you can mix it with Mayo and you can mix it with these boys. And it's all about belief, really, at the end of the day. If you, if you believe you can do something, invariably you'll be able to do it at some point. Colin, around the time that you were getting interest from Australia, <coughs> was it a case that you would have had the footballers looking for you for Tipperary, probably the hurlers were interested you, which uh, are in you at one point as well, and you were in and out of there, and then the AFL as well. Was that really tough on you, had been pulled from all directions? Yeah, it was, to be honest. It was, I think it was, I don't know what year it was, but it was 2015, in the middle of the summer of 2015. Uh, to be honest with you, I was sick of it. I was sick of football and hurling them. My hunger, at, we probably lost to Tyrone in the under-21 final and I was probably feeling a bit sorry for myself and I just said I needed a break and there was just too much going on. I couldn't, I couldn't hack it. Um, I was just sick and, and it, to be honest with you, the AFL came at, at a great time for me. I've ha I had a good year and they gave me a brand new lease of life and it was a new, <coughs> a new adventure and a new journey for me and, and something that really I really committed to and said, right, if I'm going to go over here, I'm going to give it a real shot. Um, but yeah, it did, it did have a massive toll on me being been pulled, but I kind of took a step back and just um, took the opportunity that, that, that presented itself to me. What was what was making you take the fact that everybody wanted a piece here? Yeah, it was mainly that. Like you just, I don't know. I probably lost the last three games I played that year. I lost, and um, I wouldn't say if, I was probably feeling sorry for myself a little bit. And if, um, yeah, it was probably just the whole fact that we were. I was just I was just like a losing, and I just needed a month off and. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people forget that at the end of the day, when you're playing GEA, you're amateur, and like it is a case of you kind of have to go back to work, or, or in my case, go back to college, and you don't really want to be thinking about it, you just want to get on with it, but when you don't have a chance to go out next week and actually fix it, and when you lose a final, like the under-21 final, or you lose a week later, we lost to Tyrone, and then the Wednesday after that, I think we lost to Limerick in the under-21 Harland semi-final, you're kind of like, you don't have a chance to rectify it, you can't. You can't. You have to wait till next year, and that was that was probably hard for me to take that I couldn't fix it there and then, or get a chance next week to go out and actually fix it. And um, probably probably the biggest toll that took on me. Yeah. You must miss Temple Moor, though, do you? Surely the bright lights of Temple Moor. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe in the maybe in the sunshine, but um, no, it's it's nice here now. It was twenty three degrees here today in the middle of winter, so the lads are saying it's a tough winter here. So. <laughs> it's a tough life, all right. So what's next? At what, what stage of the season are you at? And, and obviously the debut went really well. The stats were pretty impressive. So uh, is that you now part of the first team squad guaranteed for the rest of the year? or How does that work? No, nah, not at all, to be honest. Um, if you just have to keep playing consistent football, um, I'm probably lucky enough. Uh, lucky enough and it's, it's probably hard enough for me to, to deal with as well. But Swans are, are a great team and probably a top four team in the competition. And... It makes competition for places immense, um, so you can't you can't afford to drop your guard one bit. If you do, you someone will come in and scoop it off you, and then they play well. Suddenly, you can't get back in the team. So it's it's a ruthless industry, and um, yeah, there's no guarantees, and you can't you can't say you're guaranteed a, a spot for the rest of the year. You just have to keep playing consistent football, and and hopefully they pick you every week. Compared with the GA, how hard did these lads hit in the AFL? <coughs> yeah, I guess the tackle is probably the biggest thing, like. You can actually pick a lad up and, and drive him into the ground and it's gonna play on. You can you can bump off the ball to protect your teammate and but like, they're the big ones you get. So if if your your teammate's running for a ball and you're you're kind of running for it as well and you don't see your man in the corner of your eye and he's protecting his teammate by smashing you, you kinda of get a bit a bit um I don't know, you obviously get hurt from it, but it just wakes you up a bit like you don't you weren't expecting it and that's something that like off the ball stuff in the GA to be probably real hard on you. It'd be probably a red card like but the hits here are way harder. There's no yellow cards. There's no red cards. It's it's just play on a lot of the time, and um, you just get on with it. Like it's, there's a massive emphasis on recovery every week, and and that's what you have to think about. If you don't recover well from the big hits, you're not going to play next week. Well, listen, Colin. I hope the recovery goes well this week. Congratulations and uh, well done. Thanks a million for talking to us. Thanks for having us, guys.